I'm so thankful to get to, to bring this today. So growing up in a small farming community in Nebraska, God ministered to me through a desire to learn about him and his story of redemption that we get to see throughout the Bible. During my teenage and college years, I became distracted by the things of the world and made my, my own pleasures and desires of the God of my life. And throughout, without, throughout those times, God was faithful to me, always present, tugging my heart back to him, and teaching me there was more to life than my own selfishness. Looking back, I can point to many instances when he was using all of my own stuff, all of my own mess, for his good and for his glory in ways that I could never see or even understand at the time. He used my giftings, my desires, and my experiences to shape who I am today, and that further shapes how he uses me in ministries for his kingdom. Today we are going to focus our time together on the Equip the Saints, part of, the, of Park's mission statement, which reads, at Park, we exist to make disciples, equip the saints, send them out, and spread them far and wide. And we're going to do this today by looking at a part of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, but before we dig in, let me pray for our time today. Heavenly Father God, you have created each of us according to your purpose. You have designed this place, brought each of us here to this setting to grow and learn, to be set aside from the world for your will and your plans. Lord, I pray this time today would bring you glory and minister to your church. Lord, we love you and thank you for your mercies that are new every morning and your grace in sending Jesus Christ to die the death that we all deserve. May we be a church who acknowledges that good news and responds accordingly. In Jesus' precious and holy name I pray. Amen. Okay, so turn with me to Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, which you can find on page 569 of the House Bibles. Um, so we're going to jump right into the, into the middle of the letter here. So let me give you, let's give a little background on uh, how we get to our passage in chapter 4. Um, anybody who's in the Winter Women's Study is studying Ephesians or will be studying through this book of Ephesians. So I'll try to do the summaries as justice, but there's a, there's a lot of great nuggets in Ephesians if you read through it and slowly, slowly pray through it and understand what Paul was trying to experience or uh, uh, experience to the earth, communicate to the Ephesians at that time. He wrote, Paul Ecker wrote that letter in Ephesians while he was in prison in Rome. We see that in, in around 62 AD and we see that documented at the end of the Acts in chapter 28. Uh, this is alongside a couple other of the epistles that we see in the New Testament. As we see in verse one of this book, Paul announces he is writing to the saints who are in Ephesus. More on this later. This letter is broken into two parts. The first three chapters are a detailed crash course on many important theological topics. In chapter one, he formally walks the Ephesians through the obtained inheritance of those called and adopted to himself through Jesus Christ according to his will, and then thanks God for the Ephesians who are able to see through enlightened hearts in Christ. In chapter 2, he acknowledges all were dead in their sins, but have been saved by grace through faith in Christ, not by works so that no one may boast, and that we are now one in Christ Jesus through his fulfillment in the law. In chapter 3, he shows how God revealed the mystery of the that all people, including the Gentiles, are fellow heirs and members of the same body in Christ Jesus, which at the time written to, um, to the Jewish people would have been likely a big revelation to them in those days. And he finishes the first half of the letter with a prayer to strengthen the Ephesians. So in chapter 4, he starts with the term, I therefore, to transition to the last three chapters to show the Ephesians how they should apply these truths to their lives and how they should, how they should live those things out. He urges them to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which they have been called, which brings us up to this passage in Ephesians 4 through 11, 4, 11 through 16. So I'm going to read that to you. This section of Paul's letter reads as this, and it'll be on the screen. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried out by the every wind of doctrine, by human cunning and by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is, it is equipped, 
when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Paul's stating a goal here for the Ephesians in verse 12, to equip the saints of the work of the ministry for building up the body of Christ. So, who is the body of Christ? Well, Paul answers that question three chapters earlier in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 through 23, and it says, And he, meaning God, put all things under his feet and gave him, meaning Jesus, as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So we can really read this line as to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, not for building up the body of Christ, but for building up the church. The body of Christ is the church, all of us. And what is the result of this equipping and building up? It is to be at work in a process to unify and mature ourselves together as the body of believers, as a church which is, which is an active process and something we need to actively do, right? We all instinctively know that you can't go out and succeed at competing, or in my case, simply completing a triathlon or marathon. It, it requires practice, a process of individual decisions to be made to choose training over something else, other distractions of our world. What Paul is saying here is for equipping to occur, there must be active decisions made in order to do so. So we're going to spend the rest of our time answering these three main questions today. I think there's a slide for this. Who are, one, who are the saints that Paul is referring to here? What are the saints being equipped to do? And with what tools are the saints being equipped? So first, who are the saints? So Paul, we see Paul address the saints in a number of his letters. Just a few examples here. So in Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul addresses the letter to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. The Greek word here, forgive my pronunciation, hagios, which means holy one or set apart by or for God. In Colossians 1.2, Paul addresses the letter to the saints and faithful brothers in Colossae. And in, in 1 Corinthians 1.2, Paul addresses the letter to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. So, who are the saints? Well, it's all of us. All of us who trust and believe in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. You do not need to perform certain acts or have supernatural powers to be counted in the number of saints. Those who are humble and acknowledge their need for God and trust and believe in Jesus Christ are his saints, set apart by and for God for his works. The saints acknowledge the need for God because each of us, each of us sin and are in constant need of forgiveness and grace, which is freely given to them. As Paul says in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, for grace you have been saved by faith. And it is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. So this is birthday season in our home. We, we joke that um, our birthdays are November to February. Audrey's is in December. Nellie's is in February. So naturally, we're planning gifts for them, right? Well, I mean, Lane does most of the planning, let's be honest. Uh, <laughs> gift giving is not my strong suit, as attested by the shared uh, Apple app, or the notes app that Lane puts all the things that she desires as a gift that I <laughs> try to remember to look at uh, as things are coming up. So as I mentioned, Lane's birthday is at the end of this month, so she has some ideas there, but if any ideas, my inbox is always open. I'll take care of <laughs> Okay, back to the illustration with our girls. So we give presents as gift, we give gifts as parents to our girls out of our love for them. They did nothing to earn them except being born on that specific day. But that also means they aren't able to unearn them, right? Birthday gifts are for them aren't a reward at the end of a good listening day, if and when those occur. They are provided free of charge to the recipient. In the same way, salvation from our sin in Christ, sins in Christ is a gift. It is not something we can earn, but it is also not something we can unearn. There is no sin in my life or in your life that is too big for God, the creator of the universe who built everything and all things to overcome. He provides the gift to each of us free of charge to the recipient. But just like gifts on a birthday come at a cost to the giver, the cost of our salvation and my salvation 
was a much larger gift, a much larger price to pay it was Jesus Christ's death on the cross. So if you haven't ever acknowledged Jesus as your Savior, your Lord and Savior of your life, and you made it through the cold morning here to get here, I would like to invite you to do so right here in your seat today. There's not a list of things to do. You simply need to acknowledge your need for a Savior. One God has provided for all of us through Jesus who died on the cross to save us from all, all of us from the sins of the world, past, present, and those to come in the future. If you have any questions about that, I'll be down up front after service as well Pastor Joe and while deacons to the side as well. We would love to meet with you and talk with you about what Jesus has done for you, for all of us, and accepting the call from God to be adopted into his family and set apart for the world for his purposes and his plan for us. So now that we have established all believers are the saints being equipped, what are we being equipped to do? Right, that's point two. So back to the goal in verse 12 of our passage. To equip the saints for the work of the ministry. We're building up the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The work of the ministry. So what is that? What is that ministry? Well, I want you to think about a meeting maybe you've had at work or some other event, um, some, a meeting that would be successful, something you attended, right? What what may, think about what, what makes a meeting like that successful outside of the overall content of said meeting. I know in my personal experience, I find successful meetings typically end with some sort of summary of next steps. Um, and nowadays, of course, we say those out loud so that the AI note tag taker can capture all of it, right? Um, next steps are agreed upon to move forward. Well, Jesus did the same thing. Before he ascended to heaven at the end of his earthly ministry after his resurrection, what was the last thing he communicated after giving the Great Commission? Well, Luke, as the writer of Acts, captured this way better than any AI note taker that we have today could in Acts 1, 6 through 9. It goes on the slide. So when they, just in context here, Jesus, the they meaning the Jesus and the apostles, had come together, they, meaning the apostles, asked him, well, Lord, will you, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? In other words, Jesus, like, are are, are you here? going to finish your work now? You've done everything you said. You're going to finish the work. You're going to rebuild the temple, right? What are, are you doing all the things you promised to do? What are your next steps, Jesus? What is, what is the end of this ministry? And in verse 7, Jesus replied to them and said, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. Well, that's a challenge. Not to uh, want to plan ahead and know what that is. But you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. End of Jesus' earthly ministry. But before ascending, Jesus left behind next steps, just like we would in a meeting. To be his witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. So this, this is the ministry. It's similar to what Joe spoke, preached on last week in the Make Disciples and the Great Commission. After the Great Commission, he lists this. The ministry for which he is called the saints. So his next steps for us to be witnesses. Well, what, what does that mean? What, what do witnesses do? What are, what are good witnesses, right? Good witnesses don't create new facts or events. They don't make up the new ministry themselves, right? They, good witnesses had an experience, witnessed something occur, and can articulate those events to others. So Jesus' ministry list of next steps was simple. He called the apostles to observe all they experienced during his earthly ministry and provide an account to others. An account to others that would make further disciples, as I mentioned Joe covered last week, and ex exponentially expand the good news of the gospel. And where does he take, expect that to take place? Well, first, he says locally, at where they were in Jerusalem. Then in Judea, which is the area around Jerusalem. I should have a map for this. And in Samaria, the next area to the north, right north of uh, Judea. And finally, to the end of the earth. Jesus is clear here. The apostles were to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to all people until there's no place left. 
which might sound familiar because that's exactly what Park's vision statement says. Proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to all people until there is no place left. Equipping the saints at Park LP is being done to build skills to accomplish the first part of this mission, to make disciples, and the last part of this mission, to send them out and spread them far and wide. Equipping the saints is a training process to upskill the church, to proceed with Park's mission and vision, to ultimately fulfill the next step Jesus laid out prior to his ascension. Now leads us to our last question for today. With what tools are we being equipped? Well, to be able to do a job well, the right equipment is needed, right? So I want you to think about a lawn, you know, a big space of grass, you know, anybody? No? <laughs> on, a, on a cold winter day in a city, no one can move out in that? Well, imagine what that would look like, right? You know, um, and that grass typically needs to be cut occasionally, right? We can think about what tools would be, what would be very helpful. Like we could cut them with scissors, but would that really work? Would that be that effective, right? A lawnmower or something bigger that would do this more efficiently and more effectively would be much better than one person clipping each blade of grass individually. Well, in the same way, the saints of God's church have been set aside to complete a work, and the saints are called and organized into the church to complete that work. And we are provided effective tools from God as a designer and creator of the world to use in this work. Also, notice here how God, the creator of all things, who can be everywhere and know everything, know every thought each of us has, calls us to work alongside him in his mission field. He doesn't need to do that. He can do, he can do this without us, right? But he, do, he does call us to, to work alongside him. We, and we are designed to work alongside God in, the way, in this way that ever since Adam, we see Adam being called to work alongside God in the Garden of Eden. It was given a task to name the livestock and birds and the beasts as God, as God had created them. So what are those tools that God has given to us? Well, I first want you to think about your own profession, whether that be in a workplace environment on a day-to-day -day basis or in school as a student, or primarily in your own home caring for children. There are primary tools to use in those settings. Well, I didn't mention it before, like Joe said, I'm a lay elder, which means, which means on my day-to-day, -day, I have a book that's vocation outside. My day job and night job during some parts of the year, especially as I come up to busy season, is a tax accountant. Just so you know, tax day is three months and a day from today. You guys didn't think you are going to get through um, all the way through discussions about a tax guy talking about taxes, did you? I help clients every day understand the tax law and code, how to apply the rules, to specific transactions, how to structure a certain situation advantageously, and in certain cases, how to defend said position under various laws, regulations, and tax court cases. Hopefully you're still awake. This is when I was reading to my wife and she started pretending like she was snoozing. <laughs> in the profession of a tax accountant, I tend to rely on three specific tools to complete my job successfully. The first is to know the Internal Revenue Code, IRS regulations, and court case rulings which apply the rules to real life, act, real life transactions and things that occur. Think of this as sort of a handbook that guides taxpayers and tax professionals. There are rules written down. Secondly, I regularly consult with my colleagues who have different experiences than I have to treat how to treat something. People I work alongside have come across transactions, may have already thought through similar situations to the issue that I'm dealing with, and so relying on previous experience is very valuable. I also have access to experts in the field. These experts tend to be more focused on specific topics and specific things versus a colleague who sits next to me every day. As an example, shortly after a specific regulation was written by the IRS in the last eight years, our firm hired the individual who wrote that to, to come along board, advise our teams on the full intent and meaning behind complex language of that regulation because he was the one who authored it. It's really powerful to be able to get on the phone with a client and say, this is the person who was in the room who helped build this regulation, who, helped, who had the conversation about how to use the language to, to get through. It's an invaluable insight in how we could, should apply this language and how it's written down versus what was the intent and the meaning of said, of said language. Right? So in the same way God has provided effective tools for the work he's given us, in the same way that I have the 
Internal Revenue Code regulations and court cases to do my job at work. God has laid out in the Bible a framework for the Christian life. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 reads, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. He has laid it all out in his word, and he's given to us so that we may be taught and trained to do every good work. We don't need to feel lost as children, as Ephesians 4 says, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried, out by, uh, carried about by every wind of doctrine, human cunning and craftiness and deceitful schemes. All those things are used by the enemy to confuse us and turn us against each other. God instead gives us this backbone framework in the Bible that we can use to navigate the waves and the wind of living in our world each and every day. And we should rely on it and learn it and know it to the best of our abilities. In the same way, I lean on my colleagues at work. We too can lean on the giftings of each other within the church and furthermore within our small groups. In verse 11, Paul points to roles that equip the saints for the work of the ministry. It says, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. Verse, verse 15 says, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. God gave us each other for each other. He has built up the leadership and the membership of this church to speak truth and love to one another. This verse in Ephesians reminds me a lot of the verses we've studied recently in the last year in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 through 20. Paul tells the church in Corinth, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized in one body, the church. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we're all made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am a hand, and I should not belong to the body, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am an eye, I do not belong to the body, then would not make it less any part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. So he's provided each of us unique gifts and arranged us in the body, each one of us, as he chose. He did so because we cannot do this work on our own. At Park, there are real tangible ways the church is doing this. As we heard last week uh, from Brady's testimony, small group leaders are investing in lives across this body by studying the weekly small group study guides and providing a space to live life alongside other believers, growing in deeper relationships with Jesus and our community. Park also puts on more formal training sessions, such as the winter women's study that is starting in the book of Ephesians that I just mentioned, or the disciple-making intensive, VMI, starting in February, which we heard about last week. So let me encourage you, join and be active in a small group. Join DMI and or, and or participate in various other ministries as a way to further build on the gifts God has given you. Joe's Friday email is a great place to get updated on all those events happening. He, he does a great job of keeping us all up to date on things going on at Park. We encourage you to, if you're not involved, get involved or get involved in something different and meet new people in that way. Lastly, in the same way I can use resources at the firm to talk to the author of a particular regulation, God has provided access to us, to him, the author of our world, in a number of different ways. He taught us to communicate with him through prayer, as shown with the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6. When Jesus left this earth, he promised to provide the power of the Holy Spirit to come to the apostles, which occurs in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost. 
Ultimately, we see, and ultimately, we see how God sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world as a man. Jesus endured all the earthly temptations, but did so without sin. He walked among us so that we may, he may directly be able to relate to the difficulties that we experience in living of a simple, in a simple world. But he has done more than just walk in our shoes. He put the sin of the world on his back, walked up the hill to Calvary, and died the death each and every one of us deserved to die. As Ephesians 2, 5 through 6 reads, Even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together in Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Our God who did all of that out of his own love for us, May we respond with a heart overflowing with thankfulness to join together as one body. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love, equipping the saints to make disciples, send them out, and spread them far and wide. So believers in Christ, God has given us his words in the Bible and access to him through prayer. He has given you the Holy Spirit who lives within each of you. As it says in Hebrews 3, verse 7, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. I would encourage you to explore what he may be calling you to with your small group leader or with a friend. How is God calling you to the work of his ministry? Each of us can feel confident that we have all the tools we need for the work God has called each of us to do. And my prayer is that each of you feels this encouragement from the Lord today. Please pray with me.